Hi, this is Kendra from Redgate's Advocate Team. Today, I'm going to show you a workflow with SQL change automation, get hooks, SQL clone, and also some T SQL T thrown in. So we start off with our repo here. I have a sample repo that's already been set up, and I'm going to show the workflow of a developer or DBA who's starting to work with this repo. So I have the repo set up in Azure DevOps. I'm gonna go ahead, I've navigated to the repo. I'm gonna go ahead and click clone here to pop up the uh, location that I will use to get it down to my workstation, which is just a VM in the cloud uh, so that I can work on it. So I type git clone and then pop in that URL and it will bring down a copy of that repo for me to work in. I'll then change into that repo. So if I look at what's in this repo, I've got a couple folders in here. I've got one folder that's named SCA only workflow. And I've got another folder that is the T SQL T bit of that workflow. And if I open, let's look at this in a folder uh, or in a, uh, Explorer, I guess is the right way to say that. Here are those folders there. And if we look in SCA underscore or SCA only workflow, we can see what I've got is I've got a SQL project up in there. I have one SQL change automation project set up just for the database code itself. And then if we go into the one with underscore T SQL T following it, I've got another dot SQL proj file set up just for T SQL T and the tests. We can also, of course, see this in the repo itself. If we look in the repo itself, here are those folders and we can see that we have two different SQL change automation projects set up in there. When you're working with T SQL T and SQL change automation, you separate the tests and the framework itself out into its own project. I've now pulled that down, so here, in Management Studio, if I refresh my database list here, I'm going to say I want to open a project and I'm gonna go down to, let's navigate to that folder, which is in SCA only workflow. And I can open up the SCA only workflow dot SQL proj file. Now again, this is the one that has the database code in it, not the test code in it. So I'm gonna click open there. And it says, hmm, I can't load my development source as it's not set. I need to tell it where my development database is. So I'm gonna go ahead and click here and I'm gonna say what I want to use as my development database. Now let's actually go ahead and create this one. I had this one set up before in SQL clone. I actually, uh, for this, I already had a development database set up for my workstation. We're just gonna delete that pretend I didn't already have that. I could also have deleted that in SSMS. I just wanted to show that it's a clone specifically by going into that uh, view there. I'm gonna click here on SQL clone and say I wanna create a clone of an image and I can tell it what image I want it to use. So I'm gonna say SCA only workflow is my image. So as a developer, I need to know um, what image do I use for this database. And then I'm gonna say, I wanna create it on my machine and I'll, let's go ahead and name it SCA only workflow. Same name as the image, that's totally fine. This calls out to the clone server and creates a clone to use for my database so that as I'm creating code for my project, I can go ahead and work with this. And now it's looking at the code that's in source control and my database and comparing them. And it says, okay, your database doesn't have any changes that are ahead of version control. And also if there were changes in version control that hadn't yet, that needed to be applied to the clone, it could tell me there as well, right? Because maybe the image was created a little while back, right? Maybe it was from a production backup from three days ago or something there. All right, so there's one other little bit of setup that I can do here. I'm gonna clear this out 
And what I want to show you involves using some Git hooks. So I am going to actually, if I, if I show you again in my directory, I have a directory here called hooks. And if we go into hooks and we look at what's in there, I have a post checkout Git hook, a client side post checkout hook. And what that does is it calls this clone branch.ps1 script. Now, I already have these open in a text editor to show you. And what's happening in this clone branch.ps1 script is it's going to automate whenever I check out a branch, refreshing my database. Now, this is particularly useful because as I mentioned, those tests are in a separate project. What I really, really would like, if we look at my development database, I'd really, really like for this development database when I'm working on something to have the ability to run tests against it. But like a lot of people, when I'm working on something, I'm often not working on it in the master branch. I want to make sure that I've pulled the latest changes from the master branch. But when I'm working on a change, generally I want to do something like create a feature branch and work in there. So I'm going to go ahead and create a feature branch. We're going to name it. Oh, before I actually do this, <laughs> I was supposed to show you. Uh, so in the configuration for the developer, what they do is they clone the repo, they pull it down. That's step one. Step two is that they set up their development database. But step three is we need to actually tell Git, hey, when you're using Git hooks, use this folder for the Git hooks because by default, with Git, it likes to use inside the hidden .get folder, it likes to use this hooks folder that is there by default. So I have put my hooks into source control. So if I as a developer wish to use those hooks, I need to actually tell Git to use that. So here, you know, I update my Git config to say, okay, look for these client side hooks in the folder named hooks. So now I've actually done that in my get config. And that means, right, this is a post checkout hook. This means that automatically when I check out a branch and here we're creating a new branch, which creates it and checks it out. I'm going to say features and then we'll say test branch one. That's an amazing name, right? We'll go ahead and create that and it will create the branch and it will use the hooks. And what the hooks tell it to do is, the hooks call SQL clone and notice that it says, hey, we have just created a new clone named SCA only workflow. This is in my script configuration. It, if I go to the activity log here, it is actually done, first it did a rename. It took the existing database that was named SCA only workflow and it renamed it SCA only workflow underscore master and then it put my username and my username is IMDBA. And that's so that if I want to switch, you know, like any work I've done in that master database isn't lost. Maybe I want to switch back to that later, or maybe I'm going to switch between multiple feature branches. I don't necessarily want to lose the state in that database or have to do anything with it. This is a way of, in a database sense, automatically stashing those changes in database clones so that I can get them back if I switch back to that branch. It keeps the database name SCA only workflow for my current database because a lot of, not only a lot of developers, but a lot of database code is just used to always working with the same database name. So this way, if I switch, you know, I can see, oh, I've got some, some, a database associated with the master database over there and I can get it back if I want to. Now, while I am here in this database, now if I expand this, the get hooks, when I change databases, they also, they what they do is they look at that T SQL T project and they say, ah, I'm going to make sure that I, if you create a new database, I'm going to apply all of those T SQL T objects to it so that when we're working in a feature branch, I don't have to manually open that project, apply the changes to it from that project. The get hook does that for me, as well as in helping me provision the database. So now when I'm here, if I want to make a change to a table, let's just go into the designer on example table and we'll add, you know, poorly named new column. 
and let's make that a tiny ant just for fun. Let's make it a tiny ant. I'll click Control S to save that and close the designer. You know, in the real world, I might make a variety of changes <laughs> before I'm done. But in this case, I'm like, yeah, this is, I'm happy with this one change. I'm going to generate a migration for it. Then it comes up. I've created my migration and I can review it here. I can reformat it. I can add comments. I can even change the code or I could add insert, update, or delete statements, you know, whatever I want to do. I'm just going to save this after reformatting it. I can go to the migrations tab. And if I want to rename this, that's totally fine. You know, I can give this a more meaningful name. I could say, you know, added poorly <laughs> named column, right, uh, as my migration there. And when I'm ready to check it in, you know, if I want also, if I do want to add a new migration script here, I totally could as well. Now, I don't really want to do that, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of it. When I'm getting ready to check this in, I can not only run verify here, uh, and what verify does is it uses a shadow database here to generate the scripts. Now, I have a feature enabled that says I am actually using clones as the ability to provide part of my baselines. Instead of scripting out the database as a baseline script, I'm using a clone to pop in the current or a recent state of production into the baseline, and then we are applying migrations on top of that. So that is why clone is involved there. And the verification makes sure that all of the migrations that have been created on top of that baseline can be successful. I also, if I want to, I can open SQL test, and I can see that SQL test knows about my database, which happens to be called uh, SCA only workflow. And I can run either the built-in SQL top cop tests, or in this case, I have created a class of custom cross schema tests. These are in a uh, special schema named uh, X schema, and I can run these manually. Now these will also be run as part of a build when I push my branch up in order to do a pull request, but I can also run them locally if I'd like to. And that's part of the benefit of having, uh, making sure that that test project is already applied to the database. Back in the version control tab, I can say, you know, adding poorly named column, right, to my commit message. And then I can go ahead and push it up to my repo. In this case, my repo is in Azure DevOps. So if I go into my repo here, it says, oh, by the way, you have just updated this branch. Perhaps you would like to create a pull request. Well, in, in fact, I would Azure DevOps. It gives me a name by default and I can go ahead and create this. If I have rules set up to automatically add reviewers, it will do that. And if I have automated build step set up, it will run those as well using the pull request workflow. So that's just a brief introduction to how you can set up projects so that with a SQL change automation approach, you can run T-SQL t-tests. So just as a quick recap, the way you do it is you have two projects, one project for your database code and one project to resume there, one project for your database code and one project for your T SQL T code. We used a combination of Git hooks calling it SQL clone to automatically apply the test from that T SQL T project every time we create a branch. And it, what it does is it integrates with SQL clone and it says every time you create a branch, we're going to create a clone for that branch so that you can have changes in it and that by switching back and forth between branches, you don't always have to recreate the world. Your whatever work you did in that database is saved in that branch for you in a way that will integrate very nicely with Git as you work with feature branches in Git as well. Thanks for joining me for this video today. I'm Kendra Little from Redgate. Bye folks.